Well, it's an honor to be here with you. It's very much like Washington, D.C., where God has called me to live and minister, a very type A city. Uh, we live in a very type A culture and a type A time. You know, people today are fast and furious. They're committed. They're careful, often giving themselves with abandon to their career, their lifestyles, for what fulfills them. The question I think we have to ask when we're considering worldliness today, if we want to understand how our world thinks about it, is this. Can anything you love ever really be bad? Can anything you love ever really be bad? I mean, if it were bad, wouldn't we simply not love it? The very fact that we do love it, doesn't that suggest that there is something lovely about it? If it were bad, there wouldn't be anything to love in it, right? What we're called to do today is to find our passion and live into it. Find our purpose and be driven by it, right? Well, we are by nature, I think, lovers and worshipers. The only question is what it is that we will love, what it is that we will worship. And that brings us to a passage that I think will serve us well in considering this topic in 1 John. You turn to 1 John, to chapter 2. John addresses this question of can Christians have multiple loves? And here's what John says in 1 John chapter 2. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in this world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. Well, as we think about this scripture together, let's take a moment and pray. Let's ask God to enlighten our hearts. Lord, we believe that you have inspired your word. And we pray now that by your spirit, you would graciously assist us in understanding the truth of what you've inspired here and how you intend that to encourage and correct to challenge and instruct each one of us here. Lord, we pray this for our good and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as we look through these verses, I want us to consider three questions. First and briefly, what do you love? This is an obvious question coming from the text. Secondly, though, I want you to consider where your love comes from where your love comes from. So number one, what do you love? Number two, where does your love come from? And number three, where is your love taking you? Where is your love taking you? And as we ask these questions, I hope you'll see more of your own heart and more of God's truth and be moved to love him supremely. First, what do you love? Well, briefly here in verse 15, we see two different loves set forth John challenges these early Christians. He says, do not love the world. Now, immediately, if you're contrarian and you are at a theology conference, so some of you could be, you're even at the pre-conference, someone may say, but it says John himself quotes Jesus saying, God loved the world. And here he's saying to Christians, don't love the world. Is there maybe a different Greek word used for world? No, same Greek word. But just as in English, the word world can have various connotations, so it could in Greek. Here, I think what we are being forbidden to love is not the world in the sense of the collection of people made in God's image that he will draw to himself, but rather here it's that whole system that's opposed to God that typifies this fallen world. And here John gives out this warning sharply. It's in in the present tense. He's saying we are to stop loving the world. We're not to be in the habit of doing it. Now, let me just speak to you for a moment if you're here as a non-Christian. I would just hesitate to address a crowd this large 
without speaking to you as a, as a non-Christian. We are delighted you're here. Uh, there is no place we'd rather you be on a Thursday afternoon in Orlando than right here at this conference. So you're very welcome here. Um, but I want you to notice that this is a fairly tall order. You know, you may feel like you could no sooner stop loving the world than you could stop breathing. But this is where we Christians come to you with good news. God made you in his image. All of us are made with the capacity to know him, but we have all of us sinned against him. What that means is we've done what we want rather than what God wants. And God would have been entirely just to leave us under his judgment, but in his amazing love. God has taken on flesh and lived a life fully God and fully man, a perfect life. Jesus of Nazareth is the Son of God, God incarnate. And he died on the cross a death he did not need to die for himself. You and I die because we've sinned. That's what Paul argues in Romans 5. But Christ died a death not for his own sins, but to take the punishment and the penalty for the sins of all those who would ever repent of their sins and trust in him. And he was raised in victory over that death to life to show God's vindication of his ministry and his claims. And he ascended and reigns in heaven on high. And he calls us now to turn from our sins and to trust in him and his death. And he gives us new life. Now, friend, if you're here and you're not a Christian, that's what I want you to most understand from this talk. Feel free and take your after-lunch nap now. But if you can just remember that part and talk to a Christian friend here afterwards about that, about what it means to stop loving the world. Now, for us as Christians, and I'll spend most of my time here, we need to realize that John was writing these words to those who knew themselves to be Christians. And I think Christians today find these words very challenging. You know, he says here, do not love the world. Do not set your heart on the world or anything in it. What does that mean for you? Well, it means God should not have effective rivals for your affections. It, it means that God is the one who alone should be chief. So I would just ask you, what are those rivals for your affections? Can you find them? Brother or sister, if you can find them, that's a huge step in and of itself. Fix your attention on that rival very carefully. Find the name of that rival. Begin to pray about it. Don't, don't ignore it, but be thankful that God has brought it to your mind. Praise God that you can see it because one of sin's main attributes is it is sly, it is stealthy. It does not want us to notice it. Have you ever found in your Christian life that sin normally comes up to you and presents its card? I am sin, I'm going to get you to disobey God and live in a terribly self-destructive way. Friends, Satan didn't approach Eve like that in the garden, and he has continued to be subtle ever since. Jesus said that we should know ourselves. So friends, look at where your time goes. Look at where your money goes. How about your discretionary time? your discretionary money. Uh, listen to the words that come out of your own mouth. They're sort of free, daily, ongoing reports about the contents of your own heart. After all, Jesus said, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Friends, we as Christians face temptations, and we are helped in not loving the world and stopping loving the world if we know what those temptations are if we can name them and self-consciously oppose them. Uh, we'll certainly face temptation to care too much what others think of us. Sometimes we will be thought well of us for something the Lord has done in our lives or in our church or in our ministry. Other times we'll be thought poorly of because of that. Brothers and sisters, we should care more that we present a corporate witness that isn't worldly, that has stopped loving the world. John also begins to tell us why this should be the case, why we should stop loving the world. If you look here, he says that we should do it really because the love of the world is mutually exclusive with the love of the Father. You see that in the second half of verse 15. Look down at verse 15. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. No allowance is made for that. 
no exceptions. A persistence of this kind of world love shows that God is not in your heart because two loves cannot coexist, John says. The soul will point in love one way or the other. It cannot point to the world and to God at the same time. John here, I think, was faithfully passing on what he had learned from Jesus. You remember that Jesus had taught in Matthew 6 that no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. And this makes complete sense if you think about it. Their commands are are contrary. We realize that even in the workplace today. Imagine if you had two different bosses. Now, some of you may be thinking, well, I do have two different bosses. Yeah, and you've probably noticed that and complained about it. It doesn't work well, does it? You, you can't functionally have two different people giving you orders. That's a situation to simply cause grief and frustration. You can't serve two masters. You can't worship two masters. You can't love God and the world that is opposed to God. Now, have you come here today, this afternoon, to this conference, thinking that you are a Christian? Ask yourself about your own loves. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Peter says in 2 Peter 1, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. Friend, find what it is that chiefly orders your life, what you chiefly love, and you will find what you chiefly worship. You can't have God as the chief and ultimate end of your life and this world. They will too often conflict. The world commands you to put it first, but God commands you to submit all to him. The world continually commands you to engross yourself in its concerns, but God commands you to use the world very carefully, to hold it lightly. The world calls you to get your satisfaction in its God. The real God commands you to glory in the cross and to be satisfied in him and his love. The world calls you to go easy on yourself, but Christ calls you to dread the least sin more than the greatest suffering. Now, friends, how contrary and inconsistent are these two masters in their commands? God alone is to be our final master. That's why, as Christians, we can't give our ultimate allegiance to our country. That ultimate allegiance is reserved for God alone. This has cost many Christians their lives around the world, and it may again here in this country if public opinion continues to go in the direction that vilifies Christian morality. It may at some point be said that in order to have a cohesive pluralistic society, no one can teach or perhaps even believe to be true something that is unpopular. The tragic irony that a nation that was established as ours would ever sink to such a position. May it never be. But if it is, let our allegiance be clear to Savior over society, to God over government, to Christ over country. And in this nation today, I have the liberty to say this, and you to listen freely. Friend, a love of this world will be typified by selfishness. A selfishness that is entirely incompatible with loving God. How can you say that you're a follower of the Christ who went to the Garden of Gethsemane and decided to follow God's will, even if it meant laying down his life, if you are trying to protect your life in a thousand smaller ways, having learned, maybe in polite Christian society, how to do it in a way that won't be noticed or call attention to itself. Friends, a world lover is, by definition then, an idolater, a spiritual adulterer. And therefore, by definition, as John says here, cannot worship serve, love God most. That's why Jesus spoke like he did to the rich young man in Mark 10, calling him to choose. Well, my friend, for you, consider what John is saying here. Love for the world in the sense that John means it, and for God 
are inconsistent. Now, undoubtedly, all of us have evidence for both in our lives. The question we have to ask, and that John challenges us to ask here, is which one is basic? Which is the love that is most basic to the way we actually live our lives? Which, which one do you rely on, God or something else? Maybe you're one who says, oh, yeah, but I, I've got it all worked out. You see, I've got this great deal. I'm working both jobs at once. So I've got all the benefits of the world, the immediate things in life, and of loving God all at the same time. My friend, if we accomplish nothing else in this pre-conference, let me tell you right now, you are self-deceived, if that's you. You do not. If what John says here is true, those two things are incompatible. As Billy Sunday used to put it, you might as well talk about a heavenly devil as talk about a worldly Christian. As the psalmist said in Psalm 97.10, let those who love the Lord hate evil. Now the good news is, if you're a Christian, you do truly love God and praise God for that. I mean, have you, have you considered what it means in your life that you've come to know him? That you've come to know his forgiveness for your sins, that you've come to experience something of that love and to know just the tiniest bit of what, Lord willing, you'll come to know in such fullness in eternity. Friend, if you've come to know him, you want to follow him, drink in this conference. Drink in the truth you get about God and find your love for him inflamed and enlarged. Don't misunderstand what John is saying here is a call to asceticism. It's not that. The world that we're not to love here is the system of those creatures, men and demons, that oppose God. It's not the material creation itself. No, love of that world, the world opposed to God, brings us into submission to all those things or people that we love more than God. And that's exactly what John is warning us against. Paul has told us in 1 Corinthians we should use the world but not be captured by it. And if we do that then we can learn the secret of the kind of contentment that Paul knew in every situation. Jesus in John 17 prayed for us to be in the world, but protected from it, not be of it. We're not to be characterized by selfishness, nor by indifference, nor by mere altruism, but rather by active use of this world for God's glory, positively. We are to live counterculturally. Brothers and sisters, in our churches, we must strive for faithfulness in this to love God first and foremost, and reflect that in the positions we take, in the leaders that we recognize, in ministries that we conduct, in the culture, and even the style of our life together in our congregations, even in our covenanting to discipline ourselves for matters of unrepentant sin. Whether that unrepentant sin is the worldliness of non-attendance, or of lying, or of adultery. Love for, ultimate regard for God will not coexist with love for the world that is opposed to him. The second question I want us to consider from these verses in 1 John. The first one is really, what do you love? But the second one is, where does your love come from? Where does your love come from? Look at verse 16. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. Well, okay, if it doesn't come from God, then, then where does it, this love come from? Well, you, you see here, the, from the flesh, the eyes, the very act of having. We boast presumptuously about what we have. If that's a temptation to worldliness for you, read James 4. James 4 is great on that. People in the first century faced temptations in this area just like we do in the 21st century. The society these Christians were living in was not an impoverished society. Perhaps, as we've said, they had thought that because they were Christians, they could live however they wanted to, but that's not true. Now, I wonder if you've ever been reflecting on on what you love, and as you do, you know, you, you begin to realize that your loves are never neutral. Your loves are never neutral. 
Even the most apparently harmless love, if left unfettered and supreme, if not submitted to God, will ruin you. Be careful about that. Exercise your Christian liberty, yes. Watch over your heart and what you love. Leo Tolstoy told the story, how much land does a man need? In this story, the peasant Pahom uh, begins to have land greed, and he buys more and more land. And so he succeeds ultimately in acquiring vast tracts of land, but in the, in the story, just at the moment of his ultimate triumph where he acquires this absolutely huge part of land, he dies. And Tolstoy ended the story saying, his servant picked up the spade and dug a grave long enough for Pahom to lie in and buried him in it. Six feet from his head to his heels was all the land he needed. Friends, it is a false religion that idolizes the world and the things of the world, whether it is land or power or riches or reputation. It's too much weight to ask our society or our land holdings or our reputation, our job, our car, to bear to be the ultimate end of our lives. Friends, they're just not up for the task. They weren't made for that. And so where do such disordered loves come from? Well, the source of this love is one's heart. It is self-ishness. They're simply the desires of our flesh, our sinful nature. This is the terrible anti-love that showed itself when Eve was tempted in the garden. Eve should have responded to the one tempting her with, well, really, as Christ did when he was tempted in the garden, with our love for God showing itself in obedience to his commands. Well, John here gives us some idea of the extent of the ruin we suffered in the fall. This is what theologians call total depravity. Not the idea that we're all as bad as we could possibly be, but that every area of our life has been radically affected by the fall. And we have been touched by this wrong dissatisfaction with God and rebellion against him. These matters that John presents here are examples of what we used to call worldliness. But that's not a word we use much anymore. Whatever happened to it? We've even forgotten what that word means. If you don't think that's true, ask a young Christian convert, not someone who grew up in a Christian home, but ask a young Christian convert in your church what worldliness means and see if they tell you positive things or negative things. You might be surprised at the answer. Worldliness is taking an inferior good and treating it as your final ultimate end. Whether those are the pleasures of your flesh or riches or pride in earthly grandeur, it is to feel the attraction of it and to have your heart bound up with it. Th this list here is really a good list, I think, for us to pray for ourselves and our own hearts about. My friend, as you come to this text, though, what you want to do, you want to ask yourself, are you worldly like this? I mean, examine yourself. What do you do with your best time? What do you do with your best thinking? What do you do uh, about uh, the things that you care about? What do you expend most of your energy doing? What brings you the most satisfaction? Or you can think about it the other way around and get the same kind of answers. What troubles you the most? What causes you the most worry and anxiety? Is it that the name of Christ be lifted up in the situation God has sovereignly allowed you to be in? Or is it your comfort and prosperity in that situation? Worldliness may not just be all that list of sins that you long ago stopped feeling tempted by. Worldliness may have a much more subtle appearance in your own religious life. If you had to part with God or some other pleasure, can you name one that you would rather keep than part with, even if it meant parting with God? We give ourselves with abandon to our pleasures as if we would die tomorrow. But we build houses and we accumulate things as if we would live forever. If you want to consider this more, the Puritans were great at meditating on stuff like this. I encourage you to visit the Soli Deo Gloria section 
in the Christian bookstore that's here, in the resource center that's over to the right when you go out. And particularly, look for Jeremiah Burroughs. He, he published one book, A Treatise of Earthly Mindedness, that is a wonderful meditation on exactly what this kind of worldly mindedness means, what it looks like in our lives. Well, what we want to know is how can we combat these things? Well, I think you have to do just what we've been doing here verbally. You have to become aware of your own thoughts. You pursue humility for your own sins. Befriend godly people. Try to help yourself understand God's will by knowing his word. Consider the fact that you will have to stand before God and give an account. Consider Christ, as it says in Hebrews 12. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Ian Murray has summarized what worldliness is very well when he wrote, worldliness is departing from God. It is a man-centered way of thinking. It proposes objectives which demand no radical breach with man's fallen nature. It judges the importance of things by the present and material results. It weighs success by numbers. It covets human esteem and wants no unpopularity. It knows no truth for which it is worth suffering. It declines to be a fool for Christ's sake. Worldliness is the mindset of the unregenerate. It adopts idols and is at war with God. Friends, we realize the love that we are called to have is not the love of the world, but the love of God. One matter here that I want us to take a moment and note specifically, John writes a little later in 1 John 4, 7. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. The kind of love that we're supposed to have comes only from God. You can't work it up yourself. You can't take two sticks of your own righteousness and your own works and willpower, rub them together, and come up with this kind of love. This kind of love is a gift of God. Don't mistake what John is saying here. He certainly isn't saying that all cravings and all desirings are bad. For example, Jesus in Luke 22 said that he desired to eat the Lord's Supper with his disciples. Well, Luke uses the same word here that the translations have today as either craving or lust. It's a word that Paul uses in 1 Thessalonians 2 to describe his longing to see the Thessalonian believers. Well, friends, neither of these longings were bad. These were good longings. Certainly not all desires are bad. In fact, this passage mentions the love of the Father, which is the desire that we're supposed to be. We're not to become Stoics who have no desire. That's not the height of Christian maturity. We are rather to have an inflamed desire for God, the desire we were made in His image to have. Now, this is a very different idea than any kind of works-based religion, which would have been common either in the first century or is today. In Ephesus, where we think John was, religion was a flourishing matter, and it was very much a matter of what people do for their gods, because these idols can't do anything for themselves. So religion, by definition, must be what we people do for the gods. But friends, that's not at all the way it is with the true God. Now, with the true God, we revel in what God has done for us that we could never do for ourselves. We cannot finally give people a love for God. Only God himself can do that. Only God by his spirit can do that. We could not bring Christ down from heaven and we cannot put him in a human heart. It is not given to us to do that. We can share the gospel. We can work. But finally we pray for God to act because this love for God is also a gift of God. Now friend, do you see what this means for you and your desires? It means you should pray. If you want to defeat worldliness... You should pray. This is the work of God's Spirit. If you already love God, pray for more love. Pray for more love to God and, and pray for others to come to love Him who presently instead love this world. And if you already love God, thank Him for that love. It came from Him in the first place. It's nothing you've worked up by your own gifts, your own abilities. It is His gift to you. We know from Romans 3 
that there's no one who seeks God, no one who fears God apart from God's work. Therefore, if you do love God, then you should have no pride about that because it is surely his gift. It is based on nothing in you. We should cultivate such love. That's why John writes this letter to Christians. We want to use the appointed means of grace, the preaching of the word, baptism, the Lord's Supper, praying and fellowship. And we should rejoice at the great gift God has given us. And praise God that this is Christ's work. It is his work ultimately. Jesus promised in Matthew 16, I will build my church. Friend, if you're a Christian, that means that you are ultimately part of the object of Christ's own work. And Christ will succeed. Well, one more question for us. One more question for you about your love from this passage. And that's that third question I mentioned at the beginning. Where is your love taking you? We've considered what you love and where that love is from. But ask this one more question from our passage. Where is your love taking you? And I think you see in verse 17 that there are two different results of these loves. Look at the first half of verse 17. 1 John 2, 17. The world and its desires pass away. However alluring the world might have been to these first century Christians, John was addressing however much they might have been attached to the world, however strong their cravings and lustings and boastings might be, they would lose everything they craved. Everything they lusted after or boasted about, all of those things, John says, were passing. Just as he said up in verse 8, the darkness was passing. The word order in the Greek here is a little different. In the Greek, it's the world is passing away and its desires. I like that way of putting it. If your translation has done that, they've captured it well, I think. The world is passing away. I love the directness of that. The world is passing away. And then almost like it's sort of a smoky trail after it and its desires. It's a huge statement. And John was telling us that it's the case. Notice this world isn't something that will pass away, but that it is in the present, even now, passing away. This world is passing away. Anybody here from Minnesota? I see a number of hands. I hear you guys have the ice palace in St. Paul. I read about it. I've never seen it. Lots of time and money. I, I read last year that it was 75 feet high, 240 feet long, took 55,000 volunteer hours. It's really that dull up there in the winter? 55,000 volunteer hours and 7 million donated dollars to build out of 27,000 blocks of ice, each about the size of a bathtub. And yet this grand structure is open for only two weeks, usually late January, early February, and then it closes because, of course, it passes away. Now, if you want something more permanent, you can go to our Canadian friend that we saw up here a few minutes ago. Go to Quebec and just go west of Quebec, and they've got the Ice Hotel. Covering 30,000 square feet, you can actually stay the night in the Ice Hotel, and for some pretty cool prices. <laughs> its four-feet walls will keep you a toasty 25 to 28 degrees Fahrenheit, regardless of what winter fury is going on outside. And yet this hotel was open last winter only for three months. Why is that? Because it passes away. Now, friends, it's obvious to us how ice palaces pass away. It is less obvious to us how the things that we are putting our hope in are also passing away. They are no less certainly passing away. I think it's John Piper who said there are no U-Hauls behind hearses. Surely we must realize this as we live in this world. I had the honor, the honor to be the interim chaplain of the U.S. Senate a few years ago. In serving that capacity, you have to write in your prayers and fax it in ahead of time. Now, as a Baptist, I wasn't used to doing that, uh, faxing them. I write them all the time, of course. But the, uh, 
they couldn't care less what I prayed. I could pray, you know, about the carpet or in the name of Allah. They didn't care how I prayed. They cared very much that I didn't comment on SR-41 or you know, any particular bill going on politically. Well, as I thought about what I had to pray, I thought I needed to pray about exactly the point John's making here, that this world is passing, that it was appropriate to pray about that. These buildings look so permanent, but they're not. So among other things, I led in praying to God like this. We come to you in humility, realizing that amidst all the august architecture of this place and the trappings of power, that all of us are passing. You alone are eternal. Now, I have to tell you, that's news to a lot of U.S. senators. <laughs> Along with a renewed sense of your bounty, we pray for a renewed sense of our accountability. Remind all who work here in massive buildings, which seem so permanent, remind them of the brevity of life and the certainty of judgment. Friends, that's what we need to be reminded of, that this world and its desires are passing away. But look at the other half, look at the last phrase, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. Doing the will of God is, of course, what is to typify a Christian. Not that we're perfect, but I'm sure you don't need that to be clarified. But it is to be typical among us that God's will is done. What do we pray for in the Lord's Prayer? Thy will be done. Now, by nature, of course, there are none of us that do this perfectly. Romans 3.12, all have turned away. There's none who does good. No, not even one. But one of the things God's Spirit does when we're converted is to change our hearts. And we know throughout this letter that God's will revealed in this letter is primarily to love. Now, the idea of living forever would have been new to some of John's hearers, new, that is, with Christianity. You may remember the response Paul got when he preached about the bodily resurrection in Athens partly caused a, a riot. It certainly caused people to dismiss him. It caused others to be intrigued because it was a new idea. Well, John here is certainly not teaching that we are simply saved by doing the will of God. No, he's, we're saved by the work of Christ and trusting in Christ. But doing the will of God is what typifies those who are saved. So if you're not a Christian, you should realize that you are not forgiven, nor do you have eternal life nor are you accepted with God unless you will repent of your sins and trust in God's redeeming work in Christ. Christ lived that perfect life. His death pays our penalty. By that happy exchange, we are saved. The man who does the will of God lives forever, John says here. One of the most moving stories I've ever seen of this juxtaposition of this love of God that lasts eternally with the greatness of this passing world is in Chuck Colson's autobiography, Born Again. I don't know if you remember this, but back at a period when I was struggling with whether or not to go to law school or to seminary, I read this biography and particularly noticed the letter from Sergeant Nathaniel Green, a Marine sergeant in Charleston, South Carolina. Chuck Colson had just been converted and it had just hit the press during the height of the Watergate scandal in 1973. He was getting uh, loads of interesting responses about this, some positive, some negative. In the middle, he says, he got this letter. Dear sir, this may seem to you an unusual letter, however, after reading an article in the Charleston Evening Post on you, I'm gathered that you were in the past an unusual person. I'm a staff sergeant in the U.S. Air Force. For 19 years, I've been trying to find myself. I've went to church on several occasions, but they, the pastors, didn't reach me. After reading your article, it has helped me more than anything in my entire life. It is Christmas morning, and I'm usually drunk or trying to get drunk by now. But here I am watching the children open up their presents and thinking about going to church somewhere instead of the club or someone's house and get drunk. I don't even buy any booze this year. It's people in positions like you who confess their past, maybe not so good life, wrongs, or whatever it may be called, sure do help people in a position like me. I truly feel free within my inner self this morning. And I pray that God may help both of us in all of our trying efforts. I'm going to try and find that book, Mere Christianity, down here and read it myself. God blessing you, Staff Sergeant Nathaniel Green. And then Colson writes, I didn't care who saw me in my office as the tears streamed down my cheeks while I read and reread Sergeant Green's letter. He said it all. For 11 years of my life, I'd driven with every ounce of energy in my body to do the things in government 
that I believed might make people's lives better. But in all that time, I could not point to one single person, not one life, that had actually changed for the better. In fact, nothing I could reflect back on could compare to the feeling of joy I felt at the thought of one man reunited with his family on Christmas Day. And that just begins to get at what it means to love God and to have that love of God begin to reorder your life. I pray that we will increasingly know that reordering in our own lives, that we will see our minds affected, that we will recognize that this one love goes away forever. And people who give themselves to the love of the world make themselves forever bereft. But then there is this other love that comes from God and that lasts forever, that will be fulfilled forever. I could go on and on with the implications of this. But we simply realize in meditating on this, it's only a prelude to an eternity of fulfillment for the believer with the God who has saved us. Friends, we are by nature worshipers. We are by nature lovers. So the question that you need for your soul's sake to answer this afternoon more than any other is do you love God or the world supremely? My friend, love God today. As one Puritan put it, remember how dear you pay for your beloved idols. God alone can satisfy those made in his image. What shall it profit a man? If he gains the whole world, but loses his own soul. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord, you know the worldliness that tempts each one of us. Lord, we pray you would help us to see the love of the world for what it is. Take the makeup off of it in our minds, we pray. Unmask it. Oh, God, for your glory's sake, show us the truth about our love and the overwhelming truth about yours. Turn our hearts from being curved in upon ourselves to being turned to you. Oh God, be glorified in our lives as we live lives not of worldliness and taken up with the things of this world, but of godliness as we are taken up now and forever with you. We pray again for our good and for your glory through our Lord Jesus Christ who has loved us and given himself for us. Amen.